six or seven years to complete. Um, and I took it to the dean of the, of the college that I was a part of. And he said in this very patrician voice, <laughs> well, that's cute, but we don't actually let people do that. And so ever since then, I've been striving to make sure that, yes, we do let people do that. We not only let people do that, we actively support them in doing that. We give them the tools necessary for them to be successful in doing that complicated thing that I was trying to do on my own and getting shut down from as a, as a, as a sophomore, an undergraduate sophomore at the University of Alaska. So we do that here. And I'd say about three quarters of our students at Fairhaven design their own major. Um, some of those students will also do it, another major in another department. So they'll do a double major with a, with a kind of brand name major in another department. You know, maybe they want to get a journalism degree and also do an interdisciplinary degree so they can really fine tune. For example, they're interested in social justice as it applies to migrant farm workers. And they want to become expert in using journalistic tools to support the rights of those people. That would be a great combination of a main campus major and a Fairhaven interdisciplinary degree. Um, not unusual way for people to, to, to kind of apply that. And then some of our students will choose just to do a main campus major. And for those students, the, the distinction between being a Fairhaven student and being a student in just the, the department or college that their major is located in is that as Fairhaven students, they do our general education curriculum instead of the university's general education curriculum. And to be blunt about it, our general education curriculum is way better than what the university offers. Um, the university offers a very kind of cafeteria style, not very well integrated general education program. They call it the general undergraduate requirements or GURs. And um, students are not that excited about it in general. And students really like our general education, what we call our core curriculum. So whether you're doing your own major in another department or you're designing a concentration, you'll be doing the core curriculum at Fairhaven. And that is a really structured curriculum. I wonder if anyone here, if you just throw it, throw it in the chat, throw a yes in the chat, if, if one of the other schools you're considering is Evergreen State College. Is anyone here thinking of Evergreen as another alternative for your... Yeah, so some people are thinking about Evergreen. So I think it's useful, you know, as kind of a, it's, it's helpful to compare and contrast because Fairhaven and Evergreen share a lot of kind of intellectual DNA and a lot of um, mission DNA, actually. And we were started at about the same time by, by people who had similar aspirations for making education better. And, um, but as time has evolved, the two institutions have, have really chosen their own signature pathways for doing that. And I, and I think what Evergreen does is great in many, many ways. And it's very different than how Fairhaven looks. And the main distinction is that um, at Evergreen, they promote student self-direction in their learning by eliminating structure to the maximum degree possible. They want it to be as unstructured and as flexible as possible, which sounds awesome. You know, I really understand that. Um, but our philosophy is a little bit different. Our philosophy is, it's actually a big ask to say to someone, go design your own education. Go figure that out. See how that works, you know? Uh, take some classes and make something coherent out of it. Uh, which isn't to say that people don't get good advising at Evergreen. Um, so Evergreen, Evergreen has advisors, but it's really up to you as the student to reach out to those advisors and to decide when you need that advising. Whereas at Fairhaven, those steps towards designing your own degree happen in class. We have credit bearing classes that you need to take at certain points in your education. And you have in those classes a structure to help you get up to the place where you need to be to successfully design and execute your own degree. And that includes getting, getting faculty support and buy-in on your ideas so that it's, so that it's really going to have the academic legitimacy that's going to serve you in the future as you walk forward with that transcript that says you've got that degree in um, journalism and uh, social justice in the uh, farm or in North American farm worker community. Or whatever your degree title is. So that's that's really one of the important distinctions that I, I want you to have uh, in your minds is that this is actually a really structured intentional program and um, and it works for students. I think it works it serves students really well because it doesn't assume that you necessarily know how to be a self-directed learner when you start. 
we help you get to that point. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one thing that I wanted to start with. I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of signature things that some of you may be aware of. Um, you know, we have obvious, uh, the, many of you are probably aware that a big part of our mission is to support students who are, um, who, who want to become more effective change agents um, for social change and environmental sustainability. And social change is woven through almost every aspect of our programs. So when we have, uh, when we teach visual arts, for example, a lot of those visual arts courses have a social justice component. They don't just look at art, they look at the social context of art. They look at how art has been used and misused as a tool, how art has been appropriated. And so um, th that's really interwoven. Another area of programming that's similar, we have, we have a very um, high, highly thought of program in um, recording in audio in audio technology, where students learn how to be uh, how to use the, the tools of a recording engineer. But that is in the context of how does music serve a social function in society. So it's called audio technology, music, and society is the name of that of that of the minor that we offer in that subject area. And a lot of students design their own majors around that. When we talk about a major, we call it a concentration. So it's the area of concentrated studies that students do here, but that's kind of the equivalent language for a major. Uh, so that's another major, another, another significant piece of, of how Fairhaven operates. Um, uh, there are some other unique opportunities that Fairhaven students have. Uh, one of those is called the Adventure Learning Grant. Um, have, has anyone here, was anyone here interested in Fairhaven because they had heard about the Adventure Learning Grant? If you put, throw that in the chat. Anyone's heard about the, the, the Adventure Learning Grant? Sophie, you want to turn on your mic and just tell us, since you were the first one on there. Sophie, do you want to tell us what you, what you knew about the Adventure Learning Grant? Um, sure. Hi. <laughs> um, I, Sorry to put you I on the spot. Huh? Oh, no. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I kind of heard about it just through um, like social media and also just on you guys' website. Um, it just looked like a really cool opportunity to kind of like, because I've always wanted to do like study abroad, but it was like study abroad, but being able to kind of do whatever you want with it and not necessarily have to go to a school, but kind of just being able to affect the world in whatever way you can. So yeah, I thought it was really yeah. cool. Yeah, so thanks. That's, that's a really great summary of what students do in the Adventure Learning Grant. The other key part of that is that we provide the funding to make it happen. So students who are awarded the Adventure Learning Grant, um, the current level of funding is $20,000. The student, those students are given a $20,000 grant to travel uh, internationally for 10 months. And so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of study abroad programs are really restricted to people who have the independent means to do so. So it's a really, it's, it's, it's not a very socially just situation. So we, we value the Adventure Learning Grant as an opportunity to broaden the participation and study in international learning. Um, and it is, as Sophie said, it's, it's not you going and, and studying at some study abroad program. It's you creating your own international learning experience. It's very much experiential learning in its purest form. It's challenging, it's frustrating, it's amazing. And some students will travel from, from through multiple countries. Some students choose to travel just to one country. Um, just as, a, as an example, a couple of years ago, we had a student who his proposal was to study how skateboarding was impacting youth culture in different countries around the world. And so first he traveled to South Africa and he hung out with skaters there. And, and he obviously was interested in skateboarding. So he hung out with skaters there and, and became part of their community. And then he traveled to China and his, 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 his parents were Chinese immigrants. So he traveled back to China and he studied the skateboarding culture in China. And then he went to South Korea and he studied the skateboarding culture there. Um, and that, you know, that was his successful proposal. Um, you know, he, he came up with that. There wasn't a school. He didn't go to the International School of Skateboarding to study that. That was his deal. So the Adventure Learning Grant, yeah, this year we awarded four of them. Now there's a slight hitch because no one's traveling right now. So that's kind of a But as soon as international travel starts again, we will be having students travel in on the Adventure Learning Grant. And we have actually, it's, a, it's, it's an endowment. So it's guaranteed that the Adventure Learning Grant will continue into the future. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's because there are only about 400 students at Fairhaven, since we give out four or sometimes five a year, if you're here for several years and you apply a couple of times, that's actually amazing odds. If you're really interested in international travel and getting some, some, some outside funding for that, it's really cool. So also in the really cool category, I would put the Outback Farm. We have, um, we have our own gardens and community and small community farm that the, the Ferry College runs in cooperation with the student body, the student union. And students get to work uh, their work study positions on the farm. Students can have their own garden plots on the farm. We do educational, environmental education. And it's all about a three minute walk away from our main offices and classroom space on the south end of the Western Washington University campus. It's a really beautiful place. Um, other things that you know, you some of you are probably aware of, um, we, ha we actually have a fairly, a fairly structured pre-law program at Fairhaven called the Law, Diversity and Justice Program. And that was designed as a, as a tool for giving students another alternative to build the skills that they would need to get successfully through the law school application process. And we have an amazing uh, now 30 year history of students going through that program. And um, uh, we, have, we have people who've gone through that program and been judges. We have program, many people who've gone on to be lawyers. Uh, the woman who directs the program, her name is Ceci Lopez, and she is also a graduate of the program who's now, after getting her law degree and having her own private practice, has now come back to Fairhaven to teach in that program. So um, that's something that a lot of students, even if they don't decide to kind of use that as the core of their, of their concentration, a lot of students at Fairhaven are interested in how to bring legal tools to bear to affect the social justice or sustainability issues that they're really most interested in. So knowing something about the law is really helpful there. Um, similarly, a lot of students at Fairhaven are interested in bringing creative, their creative practices to bear in similar ways. And, and one of the things that is really kind of uh, idiosyncratic about Fairhaven College is we have this amazing history of documentary filmmaking at Fairhaven College. And um, including one of our graduates who was the first African-American filmmaker to win an Oscar for a feature length documentary film. Um, so we, um, we have a lot of students, we always have students, we don't have a lot of classes in documentary filmmaking, but students are doing it. This is what this is, a lot of students end up deciding, okay, I care about this issue. I want people to know about it. I've got something important to say. How am I gonna get the word out there? Well, I think I'll make a documentary film. It's a really natural thing for Fairhaven students to do. And so they find resources here at Fairhaven, they find resources in other departments. Um, we just hired a new faculty member literally last week. Uh, her name is Tootie Baker, and she is a faculty member in Comparative Indigenous Studies. And she is going to be working on documentary film related to Native American cultural practices, particularly around the migration of salmon and the importance of salmon to Native American cultures and practices and how those are being negatively impacted by the fact that salmon are so, the salmon runs in the Pacific Northwest are so much uh, depleted from what they were before colonization. So, you know, there are some very uh, big projects and students can get involved in those projects and can actually get, get access to, we have really good equipment, we've got video editing, we've got, we've got, we've got, an, we've got an, a, a cinema quality underwater camera that a student used to take video, cinema quality video of migrating salmon underwater for that for one of those videos. So anyways, there's there's just a few examples. Those are kind of a, a random sampling of cool things that you might want to know are happening at Fairhaven College. And really, I guess, Cassandra, I would say uh, maybe we could go through some questions. If we could maybe go, I'll go back up and fly back up to some of the earlier questions we got. And if anyone, this would be a good time for anyone who wants to put a question in the chat. If there's something specific about something that I've said, or just something that you want to know more about, we'll, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Yeah, we had two questions at the beginning. Um, very similar questions about creating the own major specifically about how it gets approved through Western and uh, Fairhaven College and also um, how the committee is created, so how students decide who's on their committee, that process of like getting support. Um, yeah. And then 
I would say if folks have questions like Jack said, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Well, you know, without trying to describe our whole core curriculum, because Sherry's question is really, how does the whole core, because the core curriculum does all those things. Um, and obviously there's people involved and mentors involved in every step in that. So I won't go through the whole thing, but I'll just highlight a few of the key, a key steps that happen in that process. Most students spend their first year or two at Fairhaven, depending on if they're coming in as transfer students, as for first year students, or how much, how much running start credit. Most students spend the, kind of their first year or two in exploratory studies. And then they start working with, in a couple of different classes, they start working, in, but they have an advisor. They're, everyone's assigned a faculty member who's an advisor. So you're, you're meeting with your advisor on a regular basis to talk about what classes you want to take that you're doing in that exploratory phase. And then when you get towards the end of your sophomore year, the beginning of your junior year, then you need to start making some decisions. And the first decision that students make is, am I going to do a main campus major by itself, or maybe a combination, or a Fairhaven concentration? And once you've made that decision and you've gone through a process of having an initial meeting with your, with your faculty mentors and, and a student supporter, then you take the, the real meat of this process or the tofu for vegetarians is, is the concentration seminar. And most students take that course early in their junior year, early to mid junior year. So the concentration seminar is where you actually decide what you're going to formulate for your degree. You write a document called the concentration plan that narrates what that what that process is and then you also line up you you list all the courses that you're proposing are going to be a part of your your major and that's done with a committee that you select so usually your advisors on that committee you choose some faculty member who's got a lot of expertise that might be your advisor might be someone else that person would be the chair of your committee you might have another faculty from a different department who would be on that committee. You might have a community expert on your committee. And those people will review that concentration plan. And after you go through a back and forth process, uh, once they sign off on it, then it gets reviewed one more step. The university has a curriculum committee that reviews all of the titles of the concentrations that students at Fairhaven are doing. But that, you know, then, then you, 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 you will continue to revise that as you complete your last year and a half of, of studies at Fairhaven because, you know, you'll find new things that, you know, things won't work out exactly as you planned. And so you, the, the document continues to get revised, but that's what you're held accountable to. That's, you know, a lot of, a lot of departments for their degrees have a checklist. You have to take well, that class and that class and that class. You're, you're the ones creating your, your own checklists here for the classes that are going to be required for it to be determined that you are now qualified to graduate with a bachelor's degree under the subject that you selected. So that's, uh, Sherry, I don't know if you want to start your mic. Maybe we could have a little, a little follow-up here since you put the first question on there. Do you want to ask a follow-up to that? Or did that pretty much answer some parts of your question? Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. I can. Oh, okay. Um, I think that pretty much answered what I was looking at. I have a couple, I'm a transfer student and I have a couple of people that I have who pre preliminary um, agreed to sign on as mentors, but I just didn't know what I need to give to them as I work towards that process because fall is the beginning of my um, attendance at Fairhaven, if that makes sense. So are you, are you someone, you're thinking you would, you would like to complete your degree at Western and Fairhaven in two years as a transfer student? Is that what you're thinking? Yes. So the schedule you would most likely be on then is um, your first quarter, you would take some, some core courses that are required of everyone at Fairhaven. And then your second quarter, you would take what's called the Writing Portfolio and Transition Conference class. And that's where you would make those initial set of decisions and that would then lead you the following quarter, you would take in your third quarter at Fairhaven, you would take the concentration seminar. So you wouldn't actually have to have your committee fully formulated until the beginning of the, your third quarter at Fairhaven, if that oh. helps. Yeah, it does. Oh, and, and I guess my, my last question for that is, um, how, are there strict rules about how many um, Fairhaven or Western faculty need to be on that committee? Because the two people that I've talked with, one, is, one works with a nonprofit, the other one is an affiliate professor at a different university. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some flexibility in terms of adding more people to the, to the committee. 
you definitely need to have a chair of your committee who is going to be a Fairhaven College faculty member who's going to be your primary contact here and have official sign off on behalf of the college for your 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 the degree you're planning. Usually you would have another Fairhaven faculty member on there as well. That's not always the case. So um, there's some flexibility there, but but definitely one of those one of those committee members is going to be a Fairhaven College faculty member, and maybe another one would be a, a faculty member in another department, and maybe another one would be a community member. And if you want to add more people, that's fine. It does complicate the process though, because every new person you add is another person who has to read the document and sign off, and it might have, you know, not everyone's going to have the same opinion of what you're proposing. So. It's good to keep the committee as small as, as small as possible where you feel comfortable you're getting all the advice you need. Okay, and not so all the advice, not all your advice has to be coming from the people who are officially part of your committee. Okay. So like three or four mentors would be would be fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank three, you. Three three is pretty typical. Three is typical. Okay, great. Thank you. And I want to address some of the admissions questions that are coming into the chat here. So Let's see, we have, um, do I have to apply to Fairhaven as a freshman? How long do most programs take to complete? Um, yes, so if you're coming into Western as a freshman and you're interested in Fairhaven College, I definitely recommend applying to Fairhaven College um, in order to access our majors and concentrations. Um, that process, you can email me at fairhaven.admissions.w.edu. Um, you can also, if you go to the Fairhaven website and go under apply, it tells you the application process there as well. Um, and so as far as how long it takes, it's the same as other Western students. So if you're starting as a freshman, it's a four year timeline. Um, if you're coming in as a transfer student with a degree, it's a two year timeline. If, if you decide, as I know later on someone says, um, can I switch to Fairhaven after my first year? Yes, you can. Keeping in mind what Jack said, um, that when you become a Fairhaven student simultaneous with being a Western student, you no longer have to do Western's GURs. You only have to do the Fairhaven core, whether you do a major on main campus or a major with Fairhaven. So if you're transferring in a year after you've been a Western student, um, you've essentially been working on GURs that you wouldn't have had to do if you were a Fairhaven student from the beginning. Um, we have many current Western students who during their sophomore, junior year realized that we exist who had never heard of us and then join us at Fairhaven College. So certainly um, it is possible and we support students through that process as well. So yes, you can do that. And then let's see what else we have here. Does, how does creating your own major compare to other multidisciplinary studies majors from the main WW campus? Um, I will let Jack answer that because I know you have more experience seeing the differences of how students have done those two different, the multidisciplinary degree in comparison to the interdisciplinary degree. So there are, there, they are different. Yeah, um, I guess, I guess the, the short answer to that is that um, the multidisciplinary, the, there's actually a pretty, uh, there's a pretty big distinction between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary which is, and they both have a lot of value, but multidisciplinary means you create a degree that has a bunch of different components in it. And there's not really much of a requirement that those components be integrated in a meaningful way. Um, so it's actually kind of a, in, in the, what I would call the, there, there, I think there's a hierarchy of sophistication of different levels of, of integrated learning. And multidisciplinary would be, you know, better than maybe just a pure disciplinary approach because you are getting exposed to different ideas. But interdisciplinary learning requires that you start meaningfully integrating those. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, which isn't to say that some students in that multidisciplinary degree, which is offered in another college, aren't doing some of that, but they don't have the active support that Fairhaven students do in creating that integration with the, their faculty mentors. Um, there's, there's actually a, there's a higher, there's a higher, in my hierarchy, there's something higher than uh, interdisciplinary learning, which is, I would call transdisciplinary learning. And I would love this to be called the Fairhaven College of Transdisciplinary Studies instead of interdisciplinary studies, because I think interdisciplinary studies might have been a, 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 a valuable goal 20 or 30 years ago, but we actually need to take the different ingredients of problem solving and create solutions that are that are a, 
that are a, a new, that aren't just a mixture of the old ingredients, but are actually a new set of solutions where people are taking the old ideas and turning them into new ideas. And that's how I think about transdisciplinary learning, where we, we take the mixture of what is known in our inspiration and our intentions, and we then create something new out of that. You know, something that actually did not exist before, whereas interdisciplinary learning kind of implies, yeah, we've mixed things together in cool ways, but you know, it's still the old ingredients mixed together. So that's how, that's how I see it. I'm not sure if that answers the question so much, but um, the, the other question about how, you know, how students at Fairhaven work with other departments is actually a really important thing because um, one of the frustrating things about being in any college is when you can't get access to the courses you need. And so, for example, there are a lot of majors on Western's campus where, not a lot, but there are a few very, very popular majors where students have a hard time getting access to the courses they need to graduate, even though they are majors in that department. So my son is a computer science major at, at Western. And a lot of computer science majors have trouble. There's a couple of bottleneck courses that students have trouble registering for because there's so many students, there's too many students for too few classes. Um, so that's a frustration for everyone. The way it looks for Fairhaven students is a little bit different because you're doing an interdisciplinary degree. Most of you are probably not going to have a declared major in some other department that's offering a class that you want to take. That class might be major restricted. And so sometimes, you know, working at, as a Fairhaven student is a part of the biggest part of the learning challenge is how to navigate that process and how to work your way cleverly uh, cleverly and creatively into classes that you might not technically have the 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 right to be in and Fairhaven students are are masters of this skill um yeah um so i see a few other questions um can you be a western honors college and a part of Fairhaven at the same time yes we support many students who are part of the honors college and Fairhaven college and so the way that that works is the Honors College has a few classes that they require their students to take. Fairhaven cl has classes that we require our students to take. And so then you take that set of classes, which is still amounts to less and also much more fun and relevant than the Western GURs are on their own. Um, and then the Honors College requires those students to also do a senior project. Um, if you do the interdisciplinary concentration at Fairhaven, that also requires a senior project process at the end of your four years. Um, students who have been part of both colleges, it looks different for every student, but some students have done one large project for both colleges um, and where maybe they do, they turn in the research component to one college and then the other component to the other, vice versa. Um, and so it just depends on what the student is hoping to do and bring together at the end of their four years. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, if you choose to continue with Western and then consider Fairhaven later, keeping in mind um, that if you start with Fairhaven at the beginning, then you just do the Fairhaven core and you don't have to do Western's GURs. Um, but again, that we support many current Western students who transfer over to Fairhaven College um, their sophomore or junior year. Yeah, and someone asked how long, oops, someone yeah. asked how long it takes. Yeah, so um, earlier I mentioned that if you're coming in as a freshman, it's the same timeline as other Western students. It's a four year timeline. If you're coming in as a transfer student with a transfer degree, it's two years to graduation. Um, and if you're coming in as a current Western student, depending on where you're at with your credit load, then that also depends. So if you're coming in as a sophomore and you had two years left, you still have two years. If you're coming in as a junior and you had about a year and a half left, then that's what you would have still left. Um, and then we strategize. Similar to what Jack was saying, as far as Fairhaven students getting into major restricted classes across all the majors on main campus, um, Fairhaven students get support with that from Fairhaven faculty and us on the staff team and are, as Jack said, pretty brilliant at getting into many classes. Um, there are also departments that are familiar with Fairhaven students and enjoy working with our students and so it's really just a matter of being proactive and talking to that professor beforehand, getting the override for that class. Um, it's certainly a work skill to be able to do that. So I would say if that's something that you don't feel super confident about, just know that we support students in being able to build up that work skill and advocating for themselves and being proactive 
in getting the classes that they want. Um, so it's okay if you're not like an expert in that process. We're, we're not gonna leave you stranded in figuring that out. And let's see, what about for a transfer student from another university? I'm coming to WU as a junior from a previous pre-med focus, but no longer timeline wise. Um, yeah, so Western Washington University handles the transfer equivalency report and Fairhaven College honors that process. And so we look at our core curriculum, which is a total of 12 classes, and we take into account what you've completed and we waive the classes that essentially mimic a lot of the classes that you've already taken. Um, so a lot of times transfer students who are coming in with a, without a degree um, still have many of the core classes waived for them because they've already completed so much coursework. Um, and then if you're coming in about the halfway point, so at the end of your sophomore year, beginning of your junior year, it's usually the same timeline. It's still two years to graduation. Um, so it shouldn't throw you off too much. Um, then again, if you're a transfer student where you only did one year at the previous university and you would have had three years left, then it's the same if you come to Western and Fairhaven, it's a three year timeline. Um, and we have supported pre-med students in the past. So if you were still interested in that, um, then I would love to connect you with professors who have helped students who are interested in pre-med. Let's see. And I, I would say just parenthetically there that, um, We've had a very high success rate of students who have who have completed Fairhaven's program and have then applied to medical school, which yeah, is I interesting. We've, yeah, we've never had one student actually not be able to get into medical school, I believe, who's been a pre-med with Fairhaven. And, and it's interesting because those students are navigating the fact that most, you know, that there's a there's a there's a common application, as I understand, everywhere except Texas, I think, as a, the, all other med schools outside of Texas, there's a common application. And because Fairhaven students, the Fair, your Fairhaven classes are not graded. Um, so the university does not calculate a grade point average for you because we use narrative evaluations at Fairhaven in lieu of grades as our primary mode of, of assessing your learning. The, the med school application requires there to be a GPA. So students calculate that by hand. And that process has been, has been effective. And it's interesting that Farragut students have been particularly successful at not only applying to medical school, but also to a lot of law schools, because we do have a pre-law program, and to uh, other graduate schools. And a lot of Fairhaven graduates have gone on to graduate school and have gone on to, into careers in academia. It's actually a very pretty common uh, outcome for Fairhaven students is that they go on to academia. So, if people are, are, are concerned about having a transcript from Fairhaven that includes a lot of ungraded courses because of the narrative evaluations, there may be some specific programs that, that would have a problem with that because they insist that there must be graded and a certain number of graded courses. But the experience of our students is that they have really been very successful at their further aspirations for study beyond their undergraduate. Cassandra, it looks like you're frozen on my end, so. Um... Yeah, I am having some spotty internet, but so I just turned my camera off, but I am still here. Um, just looking at some of these questions. Um, would it be possible to create a major in design or art that gears towards the animation industry? Um, do you wanna take that question, Jack, or do you want me to take that question? Uh, I mean, I'm happy to say a few things about it. This is a question that I would really want you to address to faculty that have mentored students in those areas, which, which is not me primarily. Um, you know, the, the, the possibilities are limitless. The logistics of getting it done are a separate matter, you know, because really there's, there, there, there's not a lot of constraints on what students can do to create degrees at Fairhaven. The question is, will, what, what will the resources that they need to put into that to make that degree uh, uh, effective and functional, where will they get those resources from? Will they be from Fairhaven courses? Do we teach courses in that subject at, at Fairhaven? Not very often, if ever. Um, we have in the past had some courses in animation, but it's been a long time. Are there courses at the university that might fulfill some of that? Yes. Are they a major's worth? Certainly not. So what most Fairhaven students would do in that situation is they would probably do a combination of 
looking at coursework across the university, you know, from the art department, uh, from the, the English department actually offers some courses in film, um, courses at Fairhaven itself. And then they would design some independent study. It's very common that students will design independent study into their, into their undergraduate program. And some of that independent study might actually be study from a non-accredited institute that teaches some of the, some of the skills-based stuff that are not offered in courses here. And so you can design those into an independent study and, and wrap them into your degree and get academic credit for them in that way, even if they're from a non-accredited institution. And that's a very common thing that Fairhaven students do. So someone wanting to do a, an interdisciplinary degree in that subject matter, those are, the, those are the tools that they would bring to bear. And they would be working with their committee to put together a, a coherent degree plan for all of that. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer, Jack. Um, a lot of our students have no issue being able to study the interests that they have um, when they work with their committee to get that experience through Western classes, through whatever Fairhaven is offering at the time, and then also in the community. So creating independent studies when it is relevant um, and it makes sense. So getting an internship with someone who maybe does animation or art in the community, things like that. Um, I'm looking at other questions. Um, Alessandra, when will we be choosing classes? So you'll be doing the Western Washington University orientation later this summer. Um, then you'll do the Fairhaven one around the same time. It's usually the same day. Um, and then at that time, we give you information about like registration, um, what classes you have to take your first quarter at Fairhaven, and then we support you in figuring out the rest of your schedule. So that's how that timeline looks like. Um, there's a question about what the narrative evaluation is. So keeping in mind that when you're mixing and matching classes as a Fairhaven and a Western student, that only your Fairhaven classes do the narrative evaluation. So the Western classes still give out traditional grades. Um, every Fairhaven class ends where a student writes a short essay evaluating themselves in that class and their professor writes a short essay evaluating them for that class. Um, and then that goes on your transcript and it appears instead of a traditional letter grade it appears as an S that you've satisfied the course. Um, and we feel that this works better because a lot of our students are doing a lot of work outside of the classroom, are participating in discussion in the classroom, are doing research. Um, and a traditional letter grade really can't capture the amount of work that our students are doing. And so instead in the narrative evaluation, a student can talk about the work that they've done um, and kind of the learning journey that they had. So that's what that looks like. And then let me see what else we have here. Have you had students running business blog use their business actions projects for independent study or study projects during their degrees? Yes. So, um, Usually I tell students, you know, if you haven't created an independent study at Fairhaven College, usually when you're hitting your senior year, you definitely will to be able to complete your senior project and kind of bring together what you've learned. Um, but independent studies are definitely part of the culture at Fairhaven College. Um, every student gets assigned a Fairhaven faculty advisor. This is a person who can help you know when to do independent study and when not to. So essentially going to your advisor and saying, I'm already doing this work. Um, I want to get credit for this work and so your professor can tell you whether there's a class coming up that touches on that and you can bring that work into that class and get credit for it that way or whether it is a good option for you to create an independent study and then get credit for it um, through that avenue and so students have done internships in the community and gotten credit for that students have created independent studies alongside traditional study abroad opportunities and gotten credit for extra work so for example keeping um, maybe a very specific type of travel blog while you're um, out doing your um, study abroad, things like that. So yes, I would say if you're doing work outside of the classroom, talk to your advisor, talk to us about it, because um, we are happy to help students get credit for that work that they're doing. Um, is it Cassandra, yeah. Cassandra, can I give one, one example there? Um, oh yes, please do. I, it just, it, it, it really brings to mind something that's, that's current, current in the, in the present circumstances, we had a student who was who came to Fairhaven as a as a returning student. I, I think he had done a year of college earlier in his life. He had he had had to leave college for whatever reason. He had ended up having a career working in administration at the hospital here in Bellingham, and he wanted to complete a degree because he felt that would help his professional success. And when he started designing his degree, he realized some of the projects he was working on at the hospital would really actually be a great. Um, uh, 
tool shed for him to, to learn in. And so his degree was built around designing a process for using, for having telemedicine available at the hospital here. So he, had, for his degree, he designed a telemedicine pro process while he was employed by the hospital. And he had independent studies on every aspect of this. And our faculty member, Hilary Schwant, who's in public health, was his primary mentor. And even though that, you know, she wasn't an expert in telemedicine, she had access to enough tools to support him. And so he designed that program. And, and then when the COVID-19 um, crisis hit earlier this year, the hospital was able to basically overnight implement his plan for telemedicine. And they now are doing telemedicine um, and I think in no small part because of the work that he did in his degree here. I think that's an awesome example. Um, so someone in the chat posed, asked, um, is it too late to apply to Fairhaven College for fall 2020? It is not too late to apply. Um, I put my email in the chat, fairhaven.admissions at www.edu. So if you're interested in Fairhaven College, please send me an email. I'm happy to tell you um, what that process is like, but you can find the application process on the Fairhaven website, which is just fairhaven.wu.edu. Um, and then let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, Ruby, for your question about, I think I missed your question. Um, if you go to Fairhaven for two years and then want to transfer to a different college, is that an easy process? Can you clarify a different college within Western Washington University or, or do you mean like actually like leaving Western and Fairhaven to go to a different university? Like leaving to a different university. Yeah, so I would say um, similarly to the same way that students from maybe UW might transfer to Western um, and then Western Washington University does that transfer equivalency report. Um, I would say it really just depends on the university that you um, might see yourself, like if you're moving or something and you might see yourself having to switch universities. I would contact that university um, and ask them what that process is. I know that if it's a university within the same state, usually you can see many of your uh, classes being transferred pretty easily um, versus if you're going maybe to a different state, um, that process is it's hard to say, but I would contact them. Um, because then on the, they're on the other side of it doing that report versus us doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you think like your Fairhaven like credits would probably transfer or it just depends on the college? Yeah. So how Jack was saying, um, we've had many students who are pre-med, pre-law, right? Those are some of the hardest schools that we know students have a hard time getting into is law schools and medical schools. Um, and our students have no issue going into those schools with the non-traditional Fairhaven grades. And so I imagine that if you're transferring to a different university, um, that that should not be an issue. And just knowing that you'll have like a hybrid transcripts. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to Jack, Jack, if you know anything about that, but that's my thought process. Well, you know, I would say um, in the seven years I've been Dean at Fairhaven, I've, I'm aware of um, probably a half a dozen situations where a student tried to transfer to another program and they ran into some difficulty. I'll give you an example that's kind of absurd. Well, I don't know if it's absurd, but it's, it's the most recent one in my mind. There was a student who graduated from Fairhaven like 10 years ago and they wanted to switch careers and do, um, and do the, uh, a nursing certificate or a, like a nursing tech certificate at one of the local community colleges at actually the Bellingham Technical College. And Bellingham Technical College, for a while, refused to accept our uh, Fairhaven 201 class as equivalent to English 101. They said, oh, this class doesn't, it isn't called English 101, so we're not going to accept it. And um, so that was very frustrating and stupid, to be honest with you, because our class is way better than English 101. It meets the university's requirement for English 101. It does, it's very clearly articulated what the learning outcomes are. But because it wasn't called English 101, they were worried their accreditors would, um, would not accept it. So the way that worked out was that student reached out to me and I communicated directly with the uh, director of that program. And then I had to actually run it up the, up the flagpole to the dean of that program. And uh, so I was an active agent in support of that student to make sure that that particular bit of ridiculousness did not hold. 
Okay, cool. That's awesome. Go Jack. Woo, go Jack. Yeah, that's our Dean. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, you guys, by the way. This is cool. I really just wanted to say hi, and it, it's nice to, to see you guys and answering questions. It's awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us, y'all. This has been really awesome. We have about five minutes left. Um, I am just make, going through the questions, making sure that I haven't missed anyone. I see um, your question, Sherry. Because of the changes brought on by COVID, do they anticipate maintaining online classes for all of the courses going forward in fall? Um, or do you think we'll be reverting primarily to in-person classes? As of right now, um, a final decision has not been made about whether fall classes will be online. Um, as soon as we know, we let our students know. I do want to say that working with the staff and faculty at Fairhaven College and hearing from other professors at Western who have had to switch everything to online this spring quarter, um, excuse my language, but they are kicking ass. Um, we are getting really positive feedback from our students on just, you know, how do you take classes that are really discussion focused, really hands on learning and keep that kind of energy um, and also support students through a really stressful time. And um, I think that our faculty have really are doing their best to be there for students. So I will say, you know, we'll let you know when we know, um, but keep in, just know that we'll, we're here to support students. Um, if we do have to be online, um, we're right there with you. So, yeah. I'll just add a little bit to that, Cassandra, because, you know, I, I am hip deep in, in trying to model what, what's gonna happen over the next six months or so with the, the epidemic here in Whatcom County. So it's certainly not clear to anyone in, in higher education or at the state level or at the local level exactly where we're gonna be. But I, I can tell you what my hope is. And I think what my, what my hope is, is that there will be kind of a hybrid situation in the fall where some of the large lecture hall classes will be done online because there's really not that much lost in terms of uh, having those classes be online but that students will be able to do labs, students will be able to work in the studio, and that I hope that also the small seminar classes would, would actually be moved then into the larger lecture halls, which would then be empty, so that they would be able to, you'd, have to, you'd be able to have more social distancing, but still have students all in the same space with maybe some students with more health vulnerabilities participating online. So that's the kind of hybrid situation that I'm advocating for with the university. It's not going to be my decision because the university president is going, to, is going to make this call. And I think all the universities in Washington are trying to line up on a common strategy. Um, but they're really waiting to see how, the, how, the, how the, the epidemic continues to evolve and what, what sort of guidance they're going to get from the governor. Okay, I think um, we have about three minutes left. I think we could I don't know, maybe take one more question before we end um, this session. I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Jack, for leading this webinar. Um, and I also want to let people know that we are hosting Q&A sessions for prospective students, for incoming students every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, and that is on our website. Um, you can email me for the registration if you're interested in that. And we also have um, different faculty members from Fairhaven College joining us for each of those Q&A sessions. Um, so if you didn't get to have a question answered today, um, or you think of one right after we end this webinar, um, you can email me, you can join one of those sessions. Um, feel free to reach out. And thanks for joining y'all. It was nice to get to chat with all of you. I know that someone suggested we do introductions all the way around and I would have been happy to do that, but it would have been hard with all the microphones back and forth. So apologize for the fact that we, we didn't do that. I look forward to doing that when you come to campus. Cool. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, well, I think I'm gonna sign off then. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Be oh. safe. Mr. Harry? Yes? Uh, sorry about my dad coming into the video. Showing oh, up. No problem. He's, yeah, he's, I don't think he realized what kind of call I was in. No, that's, that's fine.
<laughs> I, I wish I had my puppy here. I've got I've got a pandemic puppy that um, I don't know if anyone else has a pandemic puppy, but uh, I, got, I usually try to have my puppy around to show people. Uh, I got a doggo, but she's too heavy to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Cassandra and Mr. Herring. Okay, Bye, bye everyone. everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you.